Here we go! You're listening to Theological Discussions with Christian Anarchist. Well, I've got nothing better to do. He did not just say that. One man, one mic, plenty of scripture, and absolutely no filter for truth. He's a five-point Calvinist who affirms theistic evolution. He reeks of being hellbound. This guy shares more videos of James White than James White. He's just another stupid Bible-thumping Matt Slick wannabe. The views expressed on this show are solely those of the host and do not in its entirety express the views of the volunteering members of Spiritually Honest Ministries. Enjoy the podcast or get ready to send your hate comments. Beginning broadcast in 3, 2, 1. This is Theological Discussion. I am your host, the Christian Activist. And with me uh, is a guest, of course. It's Theological Discussion, so we're going to have a discussion. Um, I do notice, though, uh, for my guest with me, I'm noticing some echoing or feedback uh, from him. So if it's possible uh, to mute, if you, if you can, uh, to mute your mic while... Yeah, there you go. Uh, but whenever you're ready to talk, just make sure to unmute there because I don't know, there's some feedback that's been getting picked up there. But uh, going back to the, my main point, theological discussion, what the heck are we talking about? Well, uh, you've definitely seen some of my uh, videos I've made about Seventh-day Adventism. I have stated firmly that it is a cult, um, it has unbiblical practices, and someone has noticed the videos uh, who wanted to get into contact about the, and discuss this issue. He um, was a former Seventh-day Adventist. I believe he stated he was a, a, a Seventh-day Adventist for about 24 years before he left it and definitely has uh, a lot that he wants to me- mention about it and show in the same reason of what I do, to show why Seventh-day Adventism is, not, uh, is just simply an unbiblical uh, thing. So enters Matthew... Uh, if that's how you pronounce it, uh, with his work on that then. So, Matthew, uh, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be on. Glad to have you, man. So tell, so tell us about like your background on uh, being a former uh, SDA. Like what, so you were 24 years, how was that? Well, I was born and raised Seventh-day Adventist. My whole life I was with the, with the movement, mm-hmm. so wasn't until I was about 17 years old that I started to to actually read Ellen White's materials and it took me about seven years reading those works to finally realize that the stuff that she was teaching wasn't biblical whatsoever mm-hmm. and then basically everything that Ellen White teaches branches out to the rest of Adventism so everything Adventism teaches that is unique comes from Ellen White basically mm-hmm. So some of the unique ideas definitely just come straight from her. There, there's nowhere else that they would have gotten it from. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, what what are some examples of one of these uh, particular teachings and ideas? Well, the most uh, the most famous one is investigative judgment. This doctrine uh, has no biblical foundation whatsoever. It's a it's a doctrine basically that Ellen White heard from. She was taught by an individual called O.R.L. Crozier. Mm-hmm. He was walking in a in a in a was it a cornfield one day with um his buddy what was his name um Hiram Edson. And this was after the 1844 disappointment. And I'm, you're familiar with this. I heard you you know you you've gone through this for others. And after they figured out that their their doctrine, you know, Jesus didn't come back in 1844, they were in a state of depression, whatever. And then he claimed to have a vision from from God saying that Jesus did not actually, he wasn't going to return in 1844. But what he did was that he moved from the holy place to the most holy place. So when he got this revelation, he told Crozier, Crozier and him got down, they, they studied it together. 
And Crozier came up with the with the doctrine basically called investigative judgment. He went out to go teach Ellen White and her husband at the time, James White. And from then on, the moment after he told her this, Ellen White supposedly had visions concerning this doctrine. And after she had the visions concerning this doctrine, she wrote it down in her books and she started teaching it to the church. <laughs> so as soon as she hears about it, then she starts uh, getting visions and uh, professing and teaching it herself. Exactly. It's not just with the investigative judgment. She, she this this um this this the same um, pattern was shown. Basically, every doctrine that she heard from somebody else, the next day she had a dream or a vision trying to confirm it. Another one is the Sabbath. Um, Ellen White, her husband, none of them knew anything about the Sabbath, but um, Joseph Bates, which was one of the founders of Adventism as well, got in contact with Seventh Day Baptists. The Seventh Day Baptists were teaching um, him about the Sabbath. So they went in and told Ellen White about it. And Ellen White, the next day, had a vision confirming that the Sabbath was correct. And this vision is found in early writings. Um, I don't have the exact reference for me right now, but basically what it was that Ellen White went to, to heaven, mm -hmm. right? And she saw Jesus and the angels. And Jesus was guiding her through heaven. And then when Adventism with the, with the sanctuary doctrine is the belief that there's a, there's the veil that was in the tabernacle on earth that separated the holy from the most holy is still in heaven. Mm -hmm. So basically Jesus was, was walking Ella White through the veils. And then they were in the first veil, the first apartment, as they call it, the holy place. And then he was showing them her around and everything, you know, giving her a tour, but then he opened the veil and then they went into the most holy place. Where they saw the Ark of the Covenant. And then Jesus Christ opened the uh, Cornell and White. Jesus Christ opened uh, um, the Ark of the Covenant and the Ten Commandments shown. Well, here's the first mistake. Um, Ellen White said that Jesus had the Ark of the, I mean, the Ten Commandments held like a book. So nobody could see what was written inside of it. Basically saying that it was like a book that, but the Bible actually says in Exodus that the Ten Commandments, there was writings written on both sides of each of the tablets. So even if it was closed, you could still be able to see the writings outside of it. But according to Ellen White, it was closed like a book and there was no writings on the outside. Hmm. What's going on? She said that when um, Jesus Christ opened up the tablets, she saw the Ten Commandments and they were glowing. But she saw that the Fourth Commandment had a halo over it. And she was basically saying that the Fourth Commandment was the greatest of the Ten Commandments. Greatest than the, greater than the First, greater than the Second. The Fourth Commandment was the greatest of all the Ten Commandments. So, the, so um, she has a, is there a writing of this that people can go to and look up to get this vision that she procl proclaims and professes? Yeah. 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 Like, uh, do you have the exact, uh, let me, let me see. I, I have, I have her notes. Let me see if, um, I have that direct exact one. Mm -hmm. Cause after this, I do want to get into, cause you mentioned the thing with Crozier, mm -hmm. um, and I remember that in A Word to the Little Flock, she recommended people to read a Daystar, the article of which that Crozier uh, wrote something in. Right. Which the investigative judgment was at. And there's a peculiar interesting thing about this that I want to get into. But first, uh, just where people could possibly get access to the thing of where Ellen G. White is getting this idea that the Sabbath law keeping thing that this is one of the greatest commandments out of all of them. All right, one second here. Because because the, the, the Adventists that I've talked to, they just say that the Ten Commandments are just the greatest in general, that they're all on the same level of being great. But apparently with Ellen White, the Sabbath is even greater than some of the Ten Commandments. Right. Well, definitely. Ellen White teaches that the Sabbath is the greatest of them. Um, It's early writings, page 33. Early writing. So if anybody want to check that out, yeah. 33? Page 33. I can just read a, read a section of it right here. Sure thing. The paragraph says, um, Jesus opened them, as in the, the, the Ark of the Covenant. And I saw the Ten Commandments written on them with the finger of God. On one table were four and the other six. The four on the first table shone brighter than the other six, but the fourth commandment shone above them all. For the Sabbath was set apart to be kept in honor of God's holy name. The holy Sabbath looked glorious, a halo of glory was all around it. 
I said the Sabbath commandment was not nailed to the cross. So here we see that Ellen White claimed that the fourth commandment had an actual halo above it compared to all the other ones, which, which were just bright. Mm -hmm. And there's another quote. This one I don't have jotted down, but I know she said it um, I was actually doing um, conversing with Adventist Herms on this as well, and he claimed that I was making an error too. But I showed it to him that Ellen White literally said word for it that the, the Sabbath is the greatest of the commandments. But this is a good example right here, just as well. And so, and so Hermes thought, the Adventist Hermes thought that you were just making that up. Yeah. But, but it's clearly right there, and I, I'm even looking at it too. It was, yeah. well, at least on the internet thing, on the LNG White writings, it's page 32 and 33. But, you know, I'm sure, I don't know if you have an actual copy of the book itself. It could have been just on page well, the thing is with the books, they they have so many different editions now, so the pages are all different. So I think the best resource for everybody to go to is on the Ellen White website, and there's another one called Gilead, G I L E A D dot com, and that has all the Ellen White's writing on it as well. Hmm. So most of the references I make are to what people can easily find online because nobody has access to the, not everybody has access to the books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, one of the the only, the only thing that I managed to get an access of is uh, what is it? Like great controversy. Great, yeah, because there's there's a place that allows you to get a free copy of it. Yeah, great controversy is the it's an easy book to get. It's free most times. People just pass it out. You can find them in hospitals anywhere. You just find them laying around. But I would recommend uh, if you really want to understand what Ellen White taught, early writing is the is a serious book to study right there. All right, All right. fair enough there. All right, so we've covered that part there. So the one thing I want to cover is that in uh, Word to the Little Flock, Ellen G. White said right. she got a vision that Brother Crozier had the true light on the cleansing sanctuary and that it was his will that Brother Crozier should write out the view, which he gave in the Daystar Extra, February 7th, 1846. To then comment saying, I feel fully authorized by the Lord to recommend that extra to every saint, referring to every uh, person who followed the church. But when I did some researching into that uh, day star, remember, she says that the Lord authorized her to tell people to look at it. And it contains the following Qu quote, but again, they say that the atonement was made and finished on Calvary when the Lamb of God expired. So men have taught us, and so the churches and world believe. But it's none the more true or sacred on that account if unsupported by divine authority. Perhaps few or none who hold that opinion have ever tested the foundation on which it rests. So it's basically, at least what I'm reading, sounds like it's saying that the doctrine of the, the atonement being made on Calvary the atonement wasn't fully made at Calvary. Basically. You're exactly, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. And they believe that, like in 1844, that's when the atonement gets uh, filled. Not even. 1844 is a partial atonement. Adventists teach that the atonement is finished when Christ returns. Here's a quote from Great Controversy, mm -hmm. on page 480. Ellen White says, "So in the great day of the final atonement." An investigative judgment, the only cases considered are those of the professed people of God. The judgment of the wicked is a distant and separate work and takes place later at a later period. So the whole idea of, uh, of the investigative judgment, it's a, uh, they say it's a, um, it's a, it's a, a type. Adventists use a lot of typology. So they, they, it's a type of the day of atonement. Mm -hmm. And the Adventist argument is that atonement on the cross, I mean, atonement on the Leviticus 16 is not achieved till the end of the process. So Adventists will equate that the investigative judgment is a day of atonement until the investigative judgment is finished. That's when atonement is achieved among the God's people. So I've had this discussion with many Adventists and Paul in the, in the what is it, on Romans chapter 3, I believe. He says we have now received the atonement. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had many Adventists tell me, well, that was just a figure of speech. <laughs> that wasn't the literal atonement. The people who read it at that time, they, 
it, it was a, a future event that was going to happen to them. So they didn't actually literally get atonement on the cross, but they know that it was coming. So it was basically good as done. Which definitely shows a bit of inconsistency because they like to say, especially as Ellen tried to emphasize, there needs to be like a literal uh, reading and interpretation of the Bible, not just simply see uh, things as allegorical uh, for most part. Well, say that again. Well, I'm just I'm saying that that actually seems inconsistent, and with you know some as at least the Adventists I talk to always complain when people say that something is allegorical or uh, something like that, that they need to start taking it in a literal sense. And that seems to be what Ellen G. White was trying to emphasize for an awakening, was trying to get people to take the word of God literally. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, not every time. Hmm. When the doctrine suits them, they'll take it for a literal. And if it doesn't, they'll change it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For instance, um, the, the Adventist... Um, I was actually watching a video, and after the study, King James only is an actually stem from Adventist minister. Mm -hmm. So Adventists love the King James for obvious reasons. When you read Daniel chapter 8, their interpretation to the King James is what led them to this doctrine right now. Mm -hmm. It reads differently compared to the other newer translations. But for instance, the, one of the main doctrines of the Adventism is that Jesus Christ went from the Holy to the Most Holy in 1844. But when one reads Daniel, I mean, um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 20. Mm -hmm. It says that, let me put that scripture up real quick. Mm -hmm. I predominantly read from the ESV, but I'm going to quote this in the King James Version. All right. All right. By the way, thank you for like the stuff you're providing for us. This is definitely, um, I think this is a very important topic because a lot of oh, people, absolutely a lot of people like to say that there is that they're just christian like all of us but i mean they are really going against some of the teachings that the bible does talk about and that most of this is just lng white originated well let me say this you know um you know me being at being at venice for so long you know uh, i know the culture and what, what you will notice is that most adventists i would say about 70 percent are really in the church for two reasons Sabbath keeping and the dietary laws. Most Adventists don't really read what Ellen White's saying, stuff like that. But they will still defend her, but not, a, not, not from actual study, but just out of ignorance because they were told she's this and that. But there are some out there who claim that Ellen White should actually be part of the scriptures. There are those who claim Ellen White is a true prophet. There are those who claim Ellen White's words are infallible. These are the individuals that I will consider heretical. Right. Because they're teaching you to go directly against the scriptures. And they're, they're all throughout YouTube. You can find them everywhere. You know, these are the people that need to be warned about. These are the people that go out proselytizing other Christians because Adventists don't really, they don't really um, go out to convert atheists and these type of people. They actually go for those who are in other churches because they believe that their doctrine is, a, is that Sunday churches, as they call them, um, the daughters of Babylon. These are the ones that Adventists their mission. One of the three angels' message is to go out and to call people out of Babylon, so to call the people out of the Sunday churches. So their main audience that they're trying to convert to Adventism are Sunday keepers. Mm -hmm. So I think um, our churches need to um, equip their members with the knowledge of what, of what Adventists teach instead of going around, as you just said, oh, they're just, they're, they're evangelicals just as we are. No, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, I mean, they, I mean, that's the same thing they do with the uh, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, not right. necessarily so Jehovah's Witnesses. They <clears throat> immediately they have issues with us. But, like, Mormons will say, we're no different than y'all as Christians and such. That that was my experience when I was talking with a few Mormons. Right. Um, but when we start going over, you know, one of the fundamental uh, ideas that is exclusive to Mormonism, as well as what we see in SDA, I mean, it's clearly uh, contradicting the word of God. And as you and as you stated, there are people that are like uh, argue uh, rather or not she could, should be considered scripture. And a guy named Robert Olson, who was a former SDA leader and director of the White Estate, uh, mm -hmm. in 
hit in a book called what Ellen White has meant to me, which was like a collection of testimonies from other SDAs. Uh, he basically says that he believes that Ellen G. White and the apostle Paul were true prophets and were under the influence of the Holy spirit that he believes one, uh, and the inspiration of one of them is identical with the reasoning for the other, meaning that they were both inspired on the same exact level and that their writings were of divine origin. Yeah. So the def definitely mean that's there's plenty of SDAs, especially in the leadership positions that do them as inspired people. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, um, when you ask most Adventists, they'll tell you that Ellen White said, oh, I was never a prophet, or Ellen White was never a prophet. But that that's not true. Ellen White and her writings make it clear that she is a prophet. She says, um, if anybody disagrees with the testimony, they don't disagree with my words, they are disagreeing with God's words. So she equated her own testimonies to God's words. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, um, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but it said that... Um, in the days of old that Jesus, God spoke to his prophets, but now he speaks to us through his son. Ellen White says in one of her writings, I have the, I have the reference. Let me get it real quick. Mm -hmm. Just give me a second here. Right, I have so much Ellen White references, you know. Yeah, I, I got like, what is it? 38 pages of notes that I yeah. took on the, trying to cover, because I think there are three issues ultimately that separate us with between them and us as Christians, evangelicals. That is their heavy emphasis on the Sabbath, their investigative judgment and sanctuary doctrine, as well as the position they put LNG White in. Right. Because, and, and I don't know, maybe you could elaborate more on this. I don't, because there at times they say, well, I mean, she's written so many prophecies of things that come true. So uh, uh, how can you deny that she's inspired by God as a prophet? Right, right. So they, 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 yeah, that's a common claim among Adventists. I used to say it myself. I don't know why I made many prophets, prophecies that came true. But in reality, she made no prophecies that came true. Mm. One famous one is that she made a, a prophecy about some 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 building burning in New York and something uh, like that. Yeah, the you one know. that said about 9-11 or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when close examination of the prophecy has nothing to do with 9-11. Even herself, it's, it's it's documented that this was a fire that happened on um, in, in, in the early the early the early 1900s. I'm not exactly the, I'm not sure the exact date, but you so know. she was saying this building that was on fire was something that already happened. Yeah. Yeah, she she had that she she made that prophecy the day after it happened, basically. Wow. Yeah. But she makes other prophecies as well. Mm. You know, she's famous for making basically a lot of her writing is it was rather clear that she expected Jesus Christ to be turned in her lifetime. Without a shadow of a doubt. Oh yeah, definitely. It, it was stated there that she believed that it was coming soon before she would pass away. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And in other prophecies, she says that um, this one, I don't have the, um, the reference, but I can share it at a later time, you know. But basically what she was saying in this one is that, and you know, people can look this up online, you know, just type what I'm saying, basically. She was sitting at one of her camp meetings speaking to her, 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 her um, the, the leaders of the church. And she said that she was struck with vision. And this was in almost 1860 something. She was struck with vision. And she said that the Lord just showed me that some of you right here will be food for worms and you will not be part of the, 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 the Christ's second coming. When he comes, you guys will not be with us. But she also said that some of you guys standing here will never see death. So basically, she, 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 in that vision, she was saying that Christ was coming in her lifetime and that some of the people that she was speaking to that day would not experience the first death. They would be able to ascend to heaven with Christ. And Adventists believe that um, uh, the soul sleep, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with that, that once um, once one dies, they don't go to heaven. They just lay in the dirt. But this doctrine comes from the investigative judgment because the investigative judgment teaches that after 1844, there's a time that God will start to judge the living and you don't know when your name will come up. 
So the thing is, if you're already in heaven and then your name comes up to be judged and you're found wanting, you have to be kicked out of heaven. So this is why Adventism believes in the solstice doctrine because it fits with the investigative judgment. Mm -hmm. Right. So she did say, yeah, that there are people that would be food for worms and such. That they, oh, so you're familiar with this. Well, I just tried to take a look at it as well. I mean, I think I've heard of that before, and I think there's actually yeah. others, other par parts where she goes on about this as well. Right. But, yeah, I mean, uh, from what I'm looking at, it seems to say Ellen G. White, uh, one testimonies, page 131 through 132, says May 27th, 1856. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, and that's just one of them. I'm trying to remember the one that I uh, heard of, because I know there's one that uh, actually comes from another source. And is it, is it the one that, that goes something like this? Um, we, we have just a few months with the children would learn or something like that. Yeah, that's the, that's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because she said that what uh, they, the church, had learned for years, the some Maybe of the people months. need to learn for months. Yes, that they had a time limit of months in order to learn this stuff. Right, which is clearly shown that she thought Jesus was coming at that time. Yeah, here it is. In a, few, in a view given in 1850, my accompanying angel said the time is almost finished. Uh, get ready, get ready, get ready. I saw that there was a great work to do for them and but little time in which to do it. Then I saw the seven last plagues were soon to be poured out upon these who have no shelter. Early writings, uh, page 64, and then in page 67 says, now the time is almost finished, and what we have been years learning, they, the people they witness to, will have to learn in a few months. They will exactly. also have much to unlearn and much to learn again. I mean, you can't get more clear than that. She she clearly believed that Jesus was coming before she died. Well, Ellen White's been dead now for over a hundred years, so she was clearly wrong with that. Exactly. Like, like when was she around? Because I know she was like Civil War era. Like, Civil War era. Yeah, she died. I believe nineteen. Don't quote me, but it was 1914, I believe, around yeah, taking, that area. I'm taking a look on it right now. Yeah, it was. you were close, 1915. 1915, one year apart, okay. Yeah, yeah, and she was born in 1827. Right, yeah. Yeah, so... And that during that time, the, the 1800s, there was a lot of... Um, a lot of Christians were thinking Christ was coming because of the Civil War era and these type of things, so it wasn't just Adventism. You know, we all know that many cults you know, sprung up in the 1800s. In mm -hmm. fact, the Jehovah's Witnesses came from the Adventist movement. I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah, I'm, I am. They because they both yeah. uh, claim like to go off of a uh, uh, what the guy that made the 18 William uh, Miller. Yeah, William Miller, the 1843 thing. They basically go off of his whole prophecy and teachings ideas. Right. So yeah, and and that's interesting too when you think about because. It shows they're not the only ones that share the same uh, origins. Like they both have a lot of things in common in regards to their origin. They just have slight differences in doctrine. Well, there's a funny there's a funny theory going around with some some people that um because Joseph Smith died in 1844, mm -hmm. so a lot of people are saying now that Joseph Smith's spirit jumped to Ellen White because 1844 is when she got her first vision. I don't know if that's true or not. You know, that's maybe going a little too far, but that's just a little interesting thing right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But um, let me go back to the Hebrews 10. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Hebrews 10, verses 19. This is the King James Version saying, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil of, that is to say, his flesh. So these two verses right here basically destroy the whole investigative judgment doctrine. Mm -hmm. Why? Investigative judgment teaches that in 1844, that is when Jesus crossed from the holy to the most holy. We know that the tabernacle of Leviticus, Leviticus 16 had a veil that separated from the holy to the most holy. The most holy place represented God's presence, which only the high priest can enter once a year. And the holy place is where the priests were doing their work of sacrifices throughout the whole year. For Ellen White to say that in 1844, 
1,800 years after Christ, when the book of Hebrews was written before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, why is it that Paul here is saying that now we have access to the holiest of all? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So if, 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 if Jesus couldn't go there until 1844, why can the Christians in this time enter the holiest place? Mm-hmm. Well, you notice that the King James here says holiest of all. The newer translations on um, like the ESV, um, what does it say? It doesn't say holiest of all. It says it's um see Advent is like to play words with a lot of a lot of doctrine. You know? Mm-hmm. It ESV, says, which which part of this? Because I got the ESV as well on my Right, so. verse 19. Therefore, brother, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, right? Uh-huh. So the King James says holiest. So the King James is really clear what it says. And remember, Adventists love the King James. But when it comes to stuff that conflicts with their doctrine, they're quick to throw away the King James and jump with another doctrine or try to go in and, and, and mess with the Greek to try to bring up their doctrine. Right. But the actual Greek here word here is on um, Hagion, Hagios, or something like that. I forgot the exact pronunciation of it. But basically, the, the, the writers of Hebrews was correct. Christ went into the holiest of all after his ascension. Mm-hmm. It didn't take till 1,800 years later to enter the, the, this, this area. We also have Hebrews 16, 19 to 20. Hebrews 16? Six, he, Hebrews 6, excuse me. But to say, I didn't see a 16. Yeah, my there's no, yeah, yeah, my bad. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20 says, We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone, past tense, as a foreigner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So this is the second time in the book of Hebrews that it is said specifically that Jesus went behind the veil into the Holy of Holies. So the question Adventists have to ask themselves, who's correct, Ellen White or the writer of Hebrews? Now, many exactly. Adventists, right, the many Adventists, the argument they'll bring up here for Hebrews chapter 6 is that no, 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 no. The veil that it's talking about is the actual tent, the, the entrance to the tent, right? So the entrance to the tent, of course, when you enter the door, bring you to the holy place. That's the argument they use, which is kind of a nonsense argument because at this time there was no tent in Israel. It was a, a temple. So wouldn't it be a tent they'll be going through to get to the first apartment? It would be a a, 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 a literal building made out of bricks. Mm-hmm. So, you know, these are just, just so many scriptures that, that prove it's wrong. You know, Jesus was sitting at the right hand of the Father. You know, where else is the Father located but the Holy of Holies? You know, so how could Jesus not be in the Holy of Holies before 1844? Mm-hmm. You know? And then there's the thing that was mentioned in, I believe you mentioned was Hebrews 10, where talking about uh, the curtain being Jesus' flesh exactly. or through his flesh. Yeah, yeah. How could Jesus Christ in 1844 go through himself? If the mm-hmm. veil in Hebrews chapter 10, the veil in the, in the Old Testament, you know, we know that these things were shadows of things to come. Mm-hmm. The veil pointed to Christ the whole time. So if the veil represented Christ, how did Christ go through himself in 1844? So the thing is Ellen White didn't understand these things. Ellen White just literally took what other people told her, had a vision the next day, wrote it down on paper, and people believed her. There was a lot of ignorance going on at the Adventist church. Now, here's a, here's a, here's a, um, a quote from Ellen White. And I think this is one of the most heretical things she said. This is found in, um, this is found in, um, where is it? Okay, this is found in Early Writings, page 5556. Now, Ellen White says, I saw the Father rise from the throne. This is a vision that she had of the, the, the holy place. Mm-hmm. She said, I saw the Father rise from the throne and in a flaming chariot go into the Holy of Holies within the veil and sit down. Then Jesus rose up from the throne and the host and the most of those who were bowed down arose with him. I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitude after he arose. And just to add here, the careless multitude are those who go to church on Sunday and those who rejected 1844. Continuing, she says, and they were left in perfect darkness. 
Those who arose when Jesus did kept their eyes fixed on him as he left the throne and led them out a little way. Then he raised his right arm and we heard his lovely voice saying, wait here. I am going to my father to receive the kingdom. Keep your garments spotless and in a little while I will return from the wedding and receive you to myself. Then a cloudy chariot with wheels like flaming fire surrounded by angels came to where Jesus was. He stepped into the chariot and was born to the holiest where the father sat. There I beheld Jesus, a great high priest standing before the father. On the hem of his garment was a bell and a pomegranate. Uh, a bell and a pomegranate. Those who rose up with Jesus would send up their faith to him in the holiest and pray, My father, give us thy spirit. Then Jesus would breathe upon them the Holy Ghost, and that breath was light, power, and much love, joy, and peace. Now, here Ellen White is going to speak of those who did not accept 1844, those who do not accept the Sabbath. She said, I turned to look at the company who were still bowed down before the throne. They did not know that Jesus had left it. Satan appeared to be by the throne, trying to carry on the work of God. I saw them. Look up to the throne and pray, Father, give us thy spirit. But Satan would then breathe upon them in a holy influence. In it there was light and much power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's ob object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. Mm -hmm. And again, that's early writings, page 55, then page 56. So basically the issue here is that now Ellen White is saying that Jesus and the Father were in the holy place. Mm -hmm. That's a theological disaster right there because the holy place literally just meant that it was holy because it wasn't the most holy because the Father was in the most holy. So how mm -hmm. can G how can the Father be in the holy place? It doesn't make any sense. Right. So one of the other things I wanted to go over is in regards to, you know, to the prophecy, they make the connection with Daniel 8. And, you know, mm -hmm. that's where the whole basis of it goes is the... Right specific verse that says you know unto 2300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed um and they make the connection there uh how do you uh go about um this passage in in regards as now compared to what they did well the biggest thing um, with me when i was in Adventist, i was always told that the apocrypha was evil basically i should never read it Mm -hmm. So I never heard of the book of Maccabees. <laughs> well, I've heard of it, but I always, always told it was wrong. So Antiochus and, you know, however people pronounce his name, his name is always pronounced different by somebody, but I was, I never heard of him. So never hearing the, the, the other side of the argument, you're only left to believe in one because Daniel eight could be confusing to those who don't study it. But after reading the book of Maccabees and reading Josephus's writings on the, 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 the history of the Jews, so it's, it's, it's very clear who the little horn of Daniel is referring to. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is with Adventists, um, a lot of the Adventist apologists, apologists, their, their main concern is to defend Ellen White. They're just doing damage control. So the most thing now with Adventism, they will teach many Adventists in their studies and their seminars how this is not Antiochus. They will focus on it being Rome. But a right. close, in a close examination of this, it couldn't be Rome. It had, it, it's nobody but Antiochus. And there, there are many holes in Adventist theology. For one, in Daniel 8, verse 13, it says, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over the sanctuary, and the host to be trampled underfoot? Well, that's a question. Mm-hmm. That he, the, the, they're asking the question, how long will all of these things happen? Right? Verse 14 gives the answer for 2300 evenings and mornings, and the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful place. Now, the Adventist doctrine is that they claim that Daniel wasn't given a starting date for this prophecy. And that's true. There is no starting date given in Daniel 8. So they jumped to Daniel chapter 9, which is a diff completely different issue. Right, and they looked at the seventy-week prophecy that was given by the angel, mm -hmm. and then the angel began the prophecy by saying, "By the uh, out of the command to go and restore and rebuild Jerusalem." So they take this date back to four fifty-seven BC. But here's the problem: the problem is that the question was, when does this thing start? 
under 2300 evenings and mornings. So it began at 457. The problem is in 457 BC, there was no temple. There was no physical temple and there was no papacy to mess with the, the, the spiritual temple that I've this claim. Mm -hmm. So the starting date of the 457 is out of bogus because nothing happened in 457. Hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I definitely see what you're saying. What's that? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so that that right there, you know, I've asked Adventists over and over what happened in 457 BC. <laughs> no, they, they see where I'm coming from, but because of what they're taught, they have no choice but to make up excuses. I had one gentleman tell me that um, it was defiled before 57. It was defiled before 457 BC when Belshazzar started eating from drinking from the cups of the of the tabernacle that defiled the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. You know, I had one guy told me that Adam and Eve defiled the sanctuary. I don't know how they where they got that from. Wait, but, is this an Adventist that said this? Yeah, these are Adventists that told me these things. Wow. Yeah, because there, there's no there's no answer to the question. Huh. So they have to dig around in their in their box and find up just make up things. Yeah. There's literally no answer for that because there was no temple in 457 BC. Mm hmm. So, so it does seem to be consistent to say that the Antiochus, especially as mentioned in Ma not just Maccabees, because from what I hear, even Josephus, right? Uh, yeah, the same guy that we use to prove the historicity of Jesus also mentions as a historian that there, this guy, uh, Antiochus, existed. Mm hmm. Well, you know, we can go to Daniel chapter 8, verse 8. Mm -hmm. Which says, then the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken. Instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Mm -hmm. Well, if memory memory serves me right, these four horns were like 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 Shikimus, um, Ptolemy, Seleucid, and I forgot the last gentleman's name. But these were the four generals of Alexander the Great, which was the great horn that was broken. Mm. This is clear history. All theologians agree with this one. Even Adventists do. But this is where Adventists drift apart from regular Christians. Because in verse 8, it says, the four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Everybody understands that this is saying that the four horns, these four kings, went into four different directions. One went to the north, one to the east, south, and the west. But Adventists understand that this, if interpreted this way, destroys their argument. Because if these four horns came from Alexander, that means that these four horns are all Grecian kings. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So for them to be four Grecian kings, there's no way possible that Rome can be the little horn. Because mm. Rome doesn't come out of Greece. Rome comes out of Italy, which is far to the west. Right? So yeah. what the Adventist scholars say is that it, uh, instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns towards the four wind of heaven. Now, verse 9, it says, and out of one of them came a little well, anybody who reads this know that when it says out of one of them, it's talking about out of one of the four horns, correct? Mm -hmm. Adventists have no choice but to say, it doesn't say out of one of the horns it comes out of, but it comes out of one of the four winds. And one of the four winds is the West. So they completely negate the fact that it says that it came out of one of the four horns, but they interpret it to say that it came out of one of the four winds. Mm -hmm. Because if they admit it came out of one of the four horns, there's no way it can be wrong. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, and every Adventist says this, you know, they have no choice because the moment they say came out of the four winds, they stuck. They stuck. They are, yeah. So let's go over some Ellen G. White uh, quotes, because uh, I think, I mean, in regards to, like, Sabbath, we know that, uh, I mean, I, I actually did, uh, was trying to study the Great Controversy, and I noticed that in one of the writings, she mentions a, I forget what the name of the group of people are, but they were an early pre like Waldenses. Yeah, Waldenesians, yes. Uh, oh, yeah. And claimed that they were uh Saturday Sabbath keeping Christians and that they were persecuted for that. But uh that's the only time I hear of that, and that some a good bit of the works based on uh, what some people that have read the translation of because most of this is in French, the historical works on the Waldenesians. Yes. They, they weren't. Uh, it's just Saturday, these Saturday Sabbath keeping people. In fact, some include they were uh, Sunday uh, 
church attend Sunday worshiping people, they would go to church on a Sunday. Right. Um, we have no evidence that these, these individuals kept the Sabbath. Um, the late Adventist scholar Samuel Bakiokchi mm -hmm. to the, the, the authority in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the doctrine of the Sabbath, you know, my Adventist, he actually was the only Adventist to graduate from a Catholic um, institution. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of Adventists will lean more to the conspiracy theory side. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, what was I saying? You were saying something about the guy that was a scholar on the... Right, 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 right. So he himself had access to the Vatican Library. So he went and he looked up the, 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 his, the historicity of the of these Wadishians, right? Because they're not found any worse because it was the Catholics who persecuted them. So they have really all of the history of these men. Mm -hmm. Well, it is written in Latin. And one of the terms used that these people were also called, uh, what was it, Sabbatians or something like this? Sabbatians. Yeah, Sabbatarians. No, no, Sabbatis, I believe it was called. And oh, now that's a, a lot of the... Uh, huh? I would say that's a new one to me. Sabbatis. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, basically what Sabbatis meant in the Latin was sandals. So with these people, they were, they were called funny names, like weird people that called sandals because the whole, the whole um, doctrine of the Waldenses was that they were to give up all of their, all of their possessions. It was started by Waldo, and he was supp supposedly a, a rich, wealthy man. But what he got from the doctrine, he took the whole the thing with give up your wealth to the poor. He took that quite literally. He gave up all of his, all of his possessions. So all of his followers basically became poor to help out the other poor. You know, admirable act, you know, but because of, of this, what they did, they would wear clothing. So the sandals that they wore, wore were called sabbatis. And this is, is what, um, what Samuel Bakayochi, which is funny because Samuel Bakayochi believes in Ellen White, but he, he wrote in one of his papers that Ellen White was confused in her time and she was influenced by what other people told her about this. Uh -huh. now, this, is a, this is a guy who believes in Ellen White, but he himself admits that Ellen White was wrong on the Walden sins because he himself said that he looked everywhere and he admitted himself that he was looking so hard to prove Ellen White right in this one, but he could find no evidence. Mm. The Walden sins didn't keep the Sabbath. And there's an, um, online, there's a, there's an article of an individual, uh, I believe it was a, it was an apologetics website. They, they, they got in contact with a Waldensian um, priest and then they asked him, did your church ever keep the Sabbath in your history? He said, absolutely not. Mm. The Waldi, the, the, he asked an actual Waldenesian church. Yeah, they're still around today, not in the, in the North America, but they're out there in Europe somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the actual, this guy was the record keeper of all their history, you know, passed down from generation to generation. He himself clearly flat out said they never kept the Sabbath, <laughs> you know. And, and so this definitely just refutes Ellen G. White's writing and supposed understanding, because then that, I mean, if there was no historical source that says this, then the thing they'll have to say is that, well, it's given divine revelation, but we have historical evidence that also suggests that they didn't keep it whatsoever. So that would then make her a liar and not have an actual problem. And this is not just, this is not new. Um, this has been historically refuted for a long time. The thing is though, that is with Adventists, um, a lot of them are anti-intellectualism. So mm -hmm. they, they, they don't like scholarship too much. Mm -hmm. Obviously why? Because Ellen White was not a scholar and a lot of the stuff that she, she, she wrote is, is literally just bogus. It's, it's his, you know, a historical stuff. You know, yeah, I tend, I tend to stuff. notice more emotionalism in it. Like they very um, much. Yes. Yeah, as soon as you start going to like the Greek or the Hebrew or the scholarship behind something or commentaries, they're like, we don't lean to the wisdom of man. We lean towards the wisdom of God. And I'll let you watch Jesus, Jesus Christ chose 12 disciples and none of them were scholars and stuff like that. Yeah, that's the yeah. argument that you get, which is which is a bad, it's, 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 it's an embarrassing standpoint to be in because, you know, God gave us a, a great mind. We need to use that mind, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So look, yeah, the Waldens has never kept the Sabbath. Absolutely. So uh, we got a few more minutes on here. So I do want to take some time to go over some of the passages 
uh, that Ella G. White has written that I think is very questionable and that proves that if, mm -hmm. if you're going to have someone that's a prophet, uh, they can't contradict the word of God. And so I got like, you know, fundamental beliefs. Number 18 says that according to the view, Ellen G. White's writings speak with, quote, prophetic authority, even though earlier the it was tr translated as, as a continuing and authoritative source, source of, truth. of truth. And that yep. was just changed a few years ago, actually, at the general mm -hmm. conference. Yep. Um, so so we, we, we did go over her thing on the LNG White and Crozier uh, statement, but let me, let me find one here. Um, and by the way, I don't know if you didn't notice, but Crozier came to eventually reject that doctrine. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think it was like uh, like a year or a few months later that he did. Yeah, which is very, very suspect, you know. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I got here is that apparently she denied the assurance of salvation in oh, yeah. our, our review and Herald, which says we are never to rest in a satisfied condition and cease to make advancement, saying, I am saved. She goes to say, when this idea is entertained, the motives for watchfulness, for prayer, for earnest endeavor to press onward to higher attainments ceases to exist. She says, no sanctified tongue will be found uttering these words till Christ shall come and we enter in through the gates to the city of God. And then even goes as far to say uh, that it is, it is, quote, stating a falsehood to say, I am saved. No one is saved who is a transgressor, transgressor of the law of God. Yeah. But, uh, but according stems, to the Bible, stems, we're all transgressors. Of course. Again, this stems from the investigative judgment doctrine. The investigative judgment doctrine, we all as Christians are put back on probation. Mm. That's what the doctrine teaches. So, you know, our, our, our depths were only covered, but just give, we're just giving another trial, basically. So you cannot say you're saved because the moment you break the law, again, you're back into in trouble, you see? Mm -hmm. So there's never that assurance of salvation, you know, according to Adventist theology, because you're always on that probation. You're always being watched. There's a recording angel in heaven jotting down every good thing you do and every bad thing you do, and there's a scale. Mm -hmm. All the bad things on one side and all the good things on one side. Sounds a lot like and Islam when, when you think about it. It does kind of, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a salvation by works. You know, they will deny this, obviously, but that's what the investigative judgment is. Mm -hmm. um, your, your works are written um, against you. And she says, even your hidden or your forgotten sins, which are not, um, which are not repented of, will be held against you. Yeah. So basically, righteousness comes by the law, according to the investigative judgment. It comes from the keeping of the Ten Commandments, especially the Sabbath. Yeah. If you're not if you're not a Sabbath keeper when Jesus Christ returns, you're lost. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, like Galatians two twenty one, Paul says, "For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ died in vain." Exactly. So for them to say that we need to that in order to c continue to be saved or something like that is by keeping the law to be justified through it, then that's definitely a problem. And we can definitely say we have assurance because Romans 10, 9 says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. And John 5, 24, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on me that sent me as everlasting life shall not come unto condemnation. So even then, like Jesus and Paul, they were e emphasizing the issue about uh you know, the assurance of faith that people will have, will be saved if they believe these things and not, and note they yeah. didn't say keeping of the Sabbath or anything. No, it's just believing that Jesus uh, died or, or that he will die for us basically. And that if we believe in him. Well, core Adventist theology teaches that Jesus came to die for the law. Mm -hmm. He came to die for the law so we can get another chance in keeping it. Because Ellen White says that we need to prove ourselves on this earth to be able to keep the law perfectly to be able to enter heaven because if we can't keep the law perfectly here there's no need for us to be in heaven mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it's it's definitely a very interesting uh 
bunch of theology that they have in mind. Uh, and here's actually an interesting thing that I don't think a lot of them know. In Testimonies of the Church, Volume 3, page 492, she says that uh, she's been shown that no man's judgment should be surrendered to the judgment of any one man. You know, don't cling to the authority of men. Right. But when the judgment of the general conference, which is the highest authority that God has upon the earth, is exercised, <clears throat> private independence and private judgment must not be maintained, but be surrendered. <clears throat> so she's saying that all the highest authority that God has on earth is founded in the general conference. Right. The general conference is the <clears throat> is where the head of the Adventists um, lay. And basically what they teach is that when the general conference is in session, no power on earth trumps it. Mm -hmm. it sounds a lot to me like the papacy. You see? What? Oh, yeah. That, I mean, sounds they, they're, they're, this is what's funny. They, they claim to be, you know, anti-papacy anti and all that yeah. stuff. But they just reflect similar teachings and their ideas. They're both salvation by works. They both have a authority outside of the scriptures, you know, mm -hmm. and they have that, that Ellen White is that, that is the same thing as a, she's a female Pope. Pretty much a even, female even, Pope. Even today, she's been dead for so long. Her writings are still held on par to scripture. Now they won't say that, but the theology of anybody within Adventism is not judged by what the scripture says. It's judged by what Ellen White says, because if you come up with a different conclusion than what Ellen White had through your Bible study, you're wrong because mm -hmm. Ellen White's right. Right, and even historically, some people have even put her on the same level of as the scriptures are. So, it, so even the early Adventists viewed her on, on the same level as scripture. It's still being practiced today. It's still being practiced today, absolutely. And but the thing that I find interesting is again one of the things is she says this. And co contradicts the scriptures because she says the highest authority that God has upon the earth is founded in the general conference. But Matthew 28, before Jesus gives the order of the Great Commission, he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Uh -huh. Yeah, so he has the power and the authority. And that's why he's able to give them the command to go to the Great Commission. Because not only does, is he the high authority uh, in heaven, but also the high authority on earth to especially as christians right in the new testament the 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 positions that are giving in the church the highest is the is the bishop or the pastor whatever you would say mm -hmm. you know there's not there's not higher than that besides christ after that comes the christ so the whole thing with the general conference these are all man-made ideas these are not scriptural whatsoever. yeah i mean so like so what was it like whenever you left seven day Adventism? I mean, in regards, cause you I mean, I'm sure you learned about all this stuff that we were just discussing about during then. And then like, what, like, what was the ultimate straw actually? What, what ultimately made you see that it's something to just, that it's, that SDA is false. What was the one thing that made you decide to leave the church? You know, it's funny. It's one night I was at work. You know, and I was in a discussion with a friend and, you know, I just decided to, to pull out a scripture. You know, I was already struggling with Ellen White for a while. But, you know, the thing is, many, a lot of Adventists are not so sure with Ellen White, but that's not enough for them to leave the church. Because as I said before, that the, 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 the main driving point for most Adventism is the Sabbath. It's the Ten Commandments. It's the, the, the dietary laws. So one day, you know, I, because, and, and another thing was with Adventism, you're not really we're not really taught the writings of Paul too much for obvious mm -hmm. reasons. You know, it mm -hmm. contradicts most of what Ellen White says. They jump to second Peter, which says that Paul's writings are hard to understand and all this. So we're basically taught, you know, we'll teach you what Paul says. You guys don't really have to read what he says. Mm -hmm. One day I pulled up and I opened second Corinthians chapter three, verse seven to 11. All right. And let me just read that real quick. Second Corinthians three, 7 to 11. The reason why this, this, this struck me so hard is because our whole focus was on the Ten Commandments. So it says, now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of his glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? 
For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more would what is permanent have glory. So after reading that, I was like, wow. Paul just said right here that something greater than the Ten Commandments is here. You see? Because in Adventist theology, we were always taught that everything pointed to the Ten Commandments. The law wasn't done away with, as a lot of Christians said. We were still under the law and these type of things. So I was never exposed to this scripture right here. So when I read this, it made me rethink everything that I was taught. And the first thing that came up was the Sabbath, because I was a strict Sabbath keeper. So now when I jumped to Colossians 2.16 which I was always taught was never talking about the seventh day Sabbath. It was talking about all the other ones. And now I can correlate it with second Corinthians three. I can see why Christians say now that we're not under the Sabbath anymore. You see? Mm -hmm. So that was really the, that was the dagger right there. You know, from that moment on, you know, I just, just started reading more of Paul's, Paul's letters. I went to church history, just my early church fathers, what they said about the Sabbath and these type of things, you know, stuff that I wasn't taught in the church. So these things broke my confidence with that Adventist church. I felt like I was being lied to. A lot of information was being withheld from me, you know. And from that, from that, that's that's where I came to where I am now. Well, definitely glad to have you in where you are now, brother, because that's I appreciate it. I mean, that testimony right there is because it's the Bible that lets you out of it. You just read what the scripture said and it's it's right there about what the Ten Command, what the position of the Ten Commandments is in regards to yeah. the New Testament. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I can tell you for a fact, most Adventists never read that scripture before. Mm -hmm. Because when I went back to my church and I tried to have studies with many people, this was, this was alien to them. They never even knew this was in the scriptures, as I was when I first read it. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the biggest ways to reach out to Adventists is that, you know, with Paul's letters. Definitely Paul's letters, because Adventists are not really familiar with Paul's letters. Yeah. Because I, I definitely try to say the same thing, yes. Yeah, so like, you have what Paul says in this passage, mm -hmm. um, and the immediate thing that I normally see is, well, Jesus says uh, in this passage, you know, to keep my commandments, so the commandments are very important, and then goes about that Jesus kept the Sabbath, therefore we should... Keep the sabbath as well yeah, well jesus was a jew <laughs> yeah of course and, and i think that's a, it goes back to is trying to just kind of be like a judaizer a judaizers of modern day is what it's slowly starting to be as well definitely you can see though you can see the galatians the the judaizers and galatians you know they're the same thing what adventists are teaching today but they don't focus on circumcision they focus more on dietary laws on the sabbath exact same thing mm-hmm um, one of the things that I tried addressing, and I want to see what your take is on this, because right. uh, they say things like dietary laws or Sabbath keeping, something that we need to we need to focus on that. But then when you have Paul in Colossians two, sixteen and seventeen, and uh, eighteen, I believe, uh, it says, "Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regards to a festival or a new moon." Sabbath or, day. or Sabbath, but I also, yes, and or a Sabbath, and then verse 17 says, These are a shadow of the things to come. Amen. But the substance it belongs to Christ. They base, well, there are two I, things I've heard of this because in the in the King James, which is what they'll normally use, it says Sabbath days instead of all the ESV says is a Sabbath. Um, and what they'll normally say is, Well, here's the two things one is well it says therefore let no one judge you uh in the things you do is like how can you be judged for these things if you're not even uh doing sabbath or practicing things you can't be judged for something you're not doing um so basically that's like that even proves further that you need to do the sabbath in order to then uh go through this verse and then there's some that says well, this just a lot meant that some people were allowed to violate the Sabbath laws because they were weak Christians that did not know the law. But once they had enough knowledge of the law, they had to keep and observe the Sabbath. Um, 
So which of so based on those things, like what would your response be to those arguments in to this verse? Well, to be honest, the first one I didn't really quite get what you said, but the second one, um the second one, you know, it, what, what is it? Um, it starts to believe it starts in verse 14 that says, you know, um, in the end of it, having therefore nailed these things to the cross, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yeah. you got that scripture, right? That's verse 14. Yeah, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, ordinances. that was against us, which mm -hmm. was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Right. Then then you have verse 16 says uh, the something about powers and authorities, but verse 17 starts out with saying, therefore, right? Therefore, it makes a connection between what was said before and what is about to be said right now. So therefore, blah, 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 what's about to be said is because it's been nailed to the cross. So for Paul to say, therefore, because it's been nailed to the cross, let no man judge you in respect of food, drink, um, holy day, no more, no Sabbath. That's because these things were nailed to the cross. That's why you don't have to be judged by them. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. there was nobody here that was under obligation to keep the Sabbath. What I believe what was going on historically here, as goes on with most of the Pauline letters, the Judaizers were trying to force the Gentiles here to keep these things. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know what to do. So Paul told them, don't let these people judge you on these things because these things are a shadow of greater things to come. The substance belongs to Christ. Christ, I believe Christ is our Sabbath rest. The, the, the Sabbath is with all the other festival days. They pointed to Christ. You see? So by pointing to Christ, now we are we keep the Sabbath fulfilled in Christ today. You know, not in the seventh day. I have no problem if anybody wants to keep the seventh day. I have no problem if anybody wants to keep any of the festivals. Mm -hmm. But my issue is if you're trying to force others to keep it, as the Adventists are trying to do now, mm -hmm. they're going to direct violation of Colossians 2.16. But the biggest argument that I hear from Adventists and the one that I was taught to teach, to, to, to rebuke um, those who would try to bring up this passage to me was that Colossians 2.16 is not talking about the Seventh-day Sabbath whatsoever. Right. The argument is that many there are many Sabbaths in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Leviticus chapter 23 names a whole bunch of them. So I was always taught that the Sabbath in Colossians 2.16 is not talking about the Seventh-day Sabbath, but it's talking about the other ones. But that's a fallacious argument as well, because Paul starts out by saying, let no man judge you in a festival. Right? Mm -hmm. The holy day. These holy days covered all the Sabbaths already. So basically, Adventists are saying basically that Paul saying, let no man judge you in holy day, no more in holy day. Mm -hmm. You see? It doesn't make any sense. But Paul is going down in a chronological order. Festivals, these things happened once a year. The new moons happened every month. And the Sabbath happened every week. It's very clear. Mm. That's the biggest argument you'll get with Colossians 2.16 is that it's, it's just not talking about the Sabbath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. It's bad exegesis, man. It's, and it, you know, it's, it's uh, the church. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, well, no, what were you saying? No, I was saying it's bad exegesis. These, the, the individuals, they don't care what the Greek says. Even the Greek word, Sabbaton, used in this passage, it, it literally means seventh day. You know, there, there's no way around this. Oh, yeah. You know, but the Adventists, like I said, there's a lot of anti-intellectualism within the church, so they don't care what the Greek says. You can tell them, what does the Greek say? Oh, I, I don't care what the Greek says. Why didn't you study the Greek? I have the King James Bible, you know? And, uh, you know, there's another inconsistency there because Adventists, like I told you before, that they, they, they love the King James, but they'll drop it when it suits their need. We see that in the King James, it says Sabbath days, and that word days is italicized. We know that this because it wasn't in the original Greek. Right. The thing is, they will accept that. When you go back to Daniel chapter 8, and the word sacrifices, when it says um, the daily sacrifices, that word sacrifices is also in italicized. It's also italicized. But they will be the first people to tell you, oh, that word is italicized, so it's not in the original. So the 2300s were not actual sacrifices. They were actually years. So you see, there's a very big inconsistency here because they'll accept the italicized in Daniel. I mean, they'll reject it in Daniel, but they'll accept it in Colossians 2.16 because it fits their doctrine. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's all it boils down to, inconsistency. And I didn't think about that either. I mean, the King James has it italicized and it's known. If it's not italicized, not a part of the original, which mentions that for reading it like that, that says, or of the Sabbath. Exactly. No plurality, just of the Sabbath. Yeah.
because it's plural in the King James, it's talking about all the other Sabbaths. It can't be talking about the Sabbath, the Sabbath of the Lord, the fourth commandment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess for the time, for our time that we're going to wrap up here, um, what, if you were to um, come across a seventh day Adventist and you, because I know people are going to have a different approach to the gospel, especially if we're trying to relay it to a specific audience. Mm -hmm. How would you relay the gospel message for our Seventh-day Adventist neighbors out there that need to hear of the gospel? Well, the first thing I would do with the atonement with Adventists, because that, that is the good news, the atonement, you know, what Christ did first on the cross. Adventist view of the atonement is a, is, a, is, a, is a delusional one. You know, the, the investigative judgment strikes a lot of fear in the hearts of Adventists. It, it struck fear in me, not knowing if I'll be saved, not knowing that I'll be good enough. You know, like you said, it's like Islam. I don't know if I'm good enough when God returns. I don't know if I will be saved. I just got to rely on my, my good Sabbath keeping and these type of law keeping. You know, if I did good enough, the recording angel, you know, he, he put a check mark by my name and I'll enter to the gates. But you were never given that assurance. To give the Adventists assurance of their salvation, I think is one of the greatest, greatest tools in, in, in you know, um, showing them what the true gospel is, because they they they're not taught they're not taught these things. So I, I I would focus on the atonement with them. I wouldn't jump to the Sabbath. I wouldn't jump to Ellen White, and I wouldn't jump to the the dietary laws just that yet, because that brings a lot of emotion with them. And if you jump to those at first, they will likely shut you down and they will, you know, consider you a pagan Babylonian or whatever, a Sunday keeper, because these things are very, very, very emotional to them, very close to them, you know, but they're not too familiar with the atonement doctrine. So if you were to explain to them how the atonement really plays out in the Gospels, I think that would open them up to further dialogue. Right on, right on. And of course, there's different approaches with everyone because there's different type of Adventists, but I believe that that is the most consistent, you know, kindest, best way to approach it. Well, definitely thank you for that, man. Um, it's honestly a blessing to have you here, especially to go about this, because I've done the best I can to do some research on this, but... Oh, you did a think, good job, though. <laughs> like, like, thing of uh, the, the passage in Second Corinthians... Mm -hmm. I would have never thought about that. I hadn't even myself. I, I think I may have seen it, but I forgot about it. Um, right. And just especially when the main conversation and emphasis is about the Ten Commandments. I mean, just wow. It's right yeah. there. It's called it even they even called the Ten Commandments, the ministry of, of death. death. That's mm -hmm. strong words. That, that is me when I heard it. It's like, yeah. wait, the ministry, ministration or ministry of death? What, what are you talking about there? Yeah, I didn't want to accept it at first. It calls it the ministry of death. The next verse calls it the ministry of condemnation. But it makes a contrast between the new covenant. You know, Adventists are not really taught what the new covenant is either, just to bring mm -hmm. that up. You know, so to teach them what the new covenant is also a good way to bring them closer to the gospel. Amen. Amen. Well, definitely, I thank you for coming on here. Um, we're going to be ending the uh, discussion here. Um, first, I'm gonna th I think I want to do this for the first time since we got a guest. Uh, if it's possible, uh, would you like to uh, lead, end, lead us in prayer to end off of the show? Yeah, no problem. All right, thank you. All right. The kind of and the um, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day that you have given us, Lord. I thank you for giving us this platform, Lord, the internet, to be able to reach those who don't believe your gospel or those who have a different view of your gospel. We thank you for the time that you have given us, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord God. We ask that you would open the minds of the Adventists who hear these things from these individuals on podcast, Lord, that they would come to understand your truths and also be with me, Lord. Help me with my understanding and with these individuals as well. Thank you for that, for all you do for us. Amen. 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 Well, that's all the time we have for theological discussion. Uh, tune in next time. And until then, Shalom Aleichem. Peace be upon you, because I wish that upon you. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.